Matthew Connolly, Philippe Roman, Chair in History and International Affairs, based here at Ideas, but mainly Professor of History at Columbia. Looking at what you do, would it be fair to say you're a kind of historian of what we don't know? You go through stuff that's been redacted, prevented from being released by governments, mm -hmm. you compare it with what they've now released, and so on and so forth, and you make connections. Now, it seems to me you're very dependent on government. You're dependent on government to keep decent archives, mm -hmm. and you're dependent on government to declassify stuff. Right. Both of them, right. onerous activities. Mm -hmm. I have to say to you, if I were a government minister, I would say I don't need to spend on that. I've got enormous priorities. Right. Why should I go to all this trouble to make Matthew Connolly's life intellectually more interesting? Right. Well, yeah, you, you wouldn't do it for me, that's for sure. Um, but you might do it for your public. You, know, you might do it for your citizenry. Um, you know, and you might even do it for your legislature, for your Congress, because you know, my argument would be that there is a place for official secrecy. Um, of course, you know, there are many things the government has to protect. You know, there are secrets that have to be preserved. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the government has to render an account, you know, if only to taxpayers, you know, to the people who put them in office. And if they, they won't even render an account for historians to write about, then in the end, they're accountable to no one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then, we say, take an example. You find a bunch of documents that were redacted, and then, and this exists, you find Mirabile Dictu, a bunch that are no longer redacted. Right. And what you come up with is the word Kissinger has been removed. Right. Or the guy behind the coup in Iran yeah. is removed. Right. In other words, it's sort of not entirely unexpected, is it? Are you sort of confirming what, in a way more conventionally, we already knew? Well, we're beginning to get a sense of the dimensions of it, right? But what you have to begin to do, especially when we're starting to deal with millions of documents and eventually billions of them, is you have to get some sense of like the relative proportion. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, for one, as an historian, would like to know, you know, as much as historians have been interested in the coup in Guatemala, how does it figure, like in the, the larger field of American foreign policy? The things that we historians have come to be interested in, are these the things that really mattered, you know, for American diplomats, for instance? You know, so just to take one example, like you could do a traffic analysis now with all of the diplomatic cables that have been released from the 1970s, you know, more than a million of them. And what you could do is you begin to measure where you see like bursts of activity. And in some cases, what you find isn't surprising. You know, you find that the fall of Saigon in 1975, the end of the Vietnam War, you know, provokes this enormous burst of diplomatic communications. But you find other things as well, that in fact, you know, in the years that followed, one of the main concerns for American diplomats was dealing with all the refugees. You know, this was a long crisis. It didn't have the drama of the helicopters rising off the so roof. You get that. You get that from study yeah. of the redaction on redaction stuff. So this is new things that you wouldn't have got if it weren't for the fact that you were able to explore this material. Well, in this case, more than the redactions, you're looking at the full text. Yeah. You know, more than a million cables, and you're trying to measure what exactly are the things that American historians. So you're using kind of metadata the way the spies do in Prism and other things on us. You're kind sure. of reverse uh, NSA, are you? I mean, is that what you? And why not? Right? Why not? I mean. These tools of data mining were developed, you know, not only for the NSA. I mean, potentially these tools could be used by anyone, and they ought to be, you know, for the purposes of keeping government accountable. Is there a way in which the state, the people within the state, mm -hmm. are resistant to knowledge? Right. Well, what I would say is that I think, and I think most people would agree, you know, that there are secrets, you know, they have to be protected. But the current system isn't doing the job. You can find, for instance, you know, sniper manuals that have been declassified. It's, it's well known, notorious, that you can find recipes for creating explosives with garden variety materials. Most people would agree that this kind of information shouldn't be out there. But the current system is one that has zero tolerance for risk. Yeah. So what that means is they're not really prioritizing the protection of the things that really have to be protected. Yeah. So these same kinds of data mining or traffic analysis kinds of techniques can also be used by governments to do a better job of protecting that yeah. kind of information for all of us. You're off out of LSE, you've been a short time here, back to Columbia. One thing you'll miss most about LSE. Oh. <laughs> The White Horse Pub. <laughs> I mean, Matthew I... Connolly. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh -huh. I thank you for submitting yourself to the Gear to Grilling. All right, thank you. Enjoyed it.